A live broadcast of the horrific attack that left 50 people dead in Christchurch, New Zealand, remained on Facebook for 29 minutes before the tech giant removed it. That's now prompted the social media company to block all white nationalist posts on its platform. Does the self-regulation of such content go far enough in an era when anyone can broadcast to the world with the swipe of a finger on any number of platforms? To consider that, we're joined in Los Angeles, California via Skype by Sarah T. Roberts, Assistant Professor of Information Studies at UCLA and author of the forthcoming book, Behind the Screen, Content Moderation in the Shadows of Social Media. And here in our studio, Stephanie McClellan, Senior Research Associate at CG, the Center for International Governance Innovation, and Anatoly Grust, Director of Research at Ryerson University's Social Media Lab. And it's great to have all three of you on the program tonight for a very timely conversation. Sarah, uh, can I start with you and ask you, how exactly is this ban, for example, the one just announced on Facebook, how exactly is this going to work? Uh, I wish I could see that deeply inside of Facebook. I think uh, certainly it's going to take some time for this new ban to trickle down to the implementation stage with the content moderators who are on the front line. Do you think, Anatoly, that this announcement will make any difference? Mm. So it's certainly a huge announcement uh, for the platform of 2 billion people. Uh, what uh, Sarah said, I agree completely, how they're going to actually implement it. And also, what the people who have been banned and organizations that are being banned, what they're going to do about it. Because more likely they're going to uh, adjust and either go elsewhere to other platforms that uh, don't, might not care what content is being discussed and shared, or those groups will simply uh, use a kind of implicit language that uh, AI systems will not pick up on that hmm. to ban. Have we seen attempts at self-regulation by other companies on this kind of scale ever before? Uh, yeah, I think all of them have attempted it to some extent or another. Um, we've seen uh, different, and it sort of goes incrementally, and usually it's prompted by when something happens, when there's a, when there's a news story. Um, we've seen, uh, for example, um, all of the major social media companies have been quite proactive on clamping down on the Islamic State. Uh, and they've taken, uh, Twitter, I believe, has taken more than a million uh, accounts offline mm -hmm. since 2015. So th this has been done before. Um, it's just that it hasn't been done for this particular area. Uh, and, you know, previously Facebook said that they'd um, prohibited white supremacy, but not white nationalism, because they were sort of trying to thread a needle there. Mm -hmm. uh, but for other cases, I mean, this is always something that's been within their power. And it's just, I think, a lot of a, a matter of, uh, of political will of whether they do it or not. It sounds like they're not quite trying to thread that needle so carefully anymore. I don't right? think so. I don't think so. And I think, um, you, you, they're still always going to do it to an extent. I think by the sheer virtue of the fact that uh, one third of the world uses this platform and you're not going to get all those people agreeing on what it should be and what's acceptable discourse or not. So I think what we're seeing is, you know, again, when something happens like uh, like the Christchurch massacre, uh, where it becomes a huge international outrage, um, they have a lot more uh, they have a lot more incentive. It lights a fire into them to take action on something that they've been waffling on before. Sarah, let me follow up with you on that. Do you, do you notice a difference in the way that these massive social media companies are talking about themselves nowadays? Uh, certainly, I think that's down to internal change. I think, as indicated by your other guests, that's also due to massive pressure, whether it's sort of general public uh, disgust with how some of the things have been undertaken on these platforms or not, or whether it's a fear of regulation more broadly. Uh, the companies seem to be acting uh, outside of the, the party line of uh, free speech or that all dis discourse has a place on platforms. And I think it's high time for that. As your other guests pointed out, it's going to take coordination among the platforms, really, if these, if these changes are going to take hold in, me in a meaningful way. So we have yet to see what other platforms will do in response to Facebook's move. Anatoly, uh, moderating online content is always fraught with controversy. In your view, how well are the social media giants doing at it? Hmm. Well, when we talk about content moderation, we have to realize it's a kind of multi-level system. You start with uh, automated system that detects potentially harmful content. Then it may go to human moderators who then decide, well, is it? And they have a few seconds to decide. 
then we have to remember there are community moderators. Let's say Facebook page uh, or Facebook group will have two or three of them. And so they also have to kind of see what content their members post and decide. Uh, one of the projects, just to give you an example of complexity of moderation in general, one of the projects we did in the social media lab looked at how people express uh, different views in regard to news stories related to race, race, ethnicity, and religion. And so those are sometimes controversial posts that people post. And we wanted to know whether this, uh, you know, the frontline community moderators are able to capture some of these racist remarks and remove them. Uh, in our case, was Facebook, uh, one of the Facebook pages. Uh, and so we found that 20% of messages, even after co community moderators stepped in, they were still included some ra racial and race-related uh, uh, hate speech. Uh, so just to show you that it's... Uh, the it's filter a, is not perfect. Not perfect. Hmm. How about you, Steffi? What's your view on how well they moderate uh, abusive content, for example? Um, abusive content is, is one area where they, they pretty much constantly come under criticism for that. Um, and again, whether it's a matter of uh, it not being picked up by the system, uh, whether it's a matter of the, uh, you know, the abusers being able to sort of game the system in a way where they know, you know, they know where the lines are and they know just how far they can go before they, before they reach over the line. Hmm. Um, so it's, I mean, they're, they're making progress, again, I think because they've, they've had so much criticism of this. Uh, I know Twitter has done a lot of work to, to adjust their tools um, to, for, to make it easier to report uh, abusive behavior and uh, you know, sort of mob abuse where people pile on, which was not always getting picked up before. So, um, you know, they're, they're making progress, but I think um, just the sheer scale of this, um, you know, if you look, like a, if you look at a, a platform like Facebook that serves 2 billion people, if you've got 1% of those people posting harmful or abusive content, that's, that's still 20, that's 20 million. That's 20 a million. lot. That's incredible. Yeah. Uh, Sarah, just before I get you to weigh in on that, let's, let's just share a clip. This is what Facebook thinks it's doing. So, Sheldon, let's roll that clip. We've spent years building computer vision technology to identify exactly this kind of content. Computer vision is the branch of artificial intelligence that enables machines to visually see what's in a photo, such as, in this case, perhaps blood or gore. In fact, 97% of the graphic violence that we take down is detected by our systems before anyone even reports it to us. Sarah, that suggests they're doing a pretty good job at catching most of the bad stuff. Do you think they are? Uh, it, it's also an issue of impact. It's not just that there may be one incident that doesn't get picked up by these automated systems. It's the impact that such an incident can have. And when we think about the horrific events in New Zealand, that's a really unfortunate case in point of what I'm talking about. Now, we're talking about this, obviously, tonight on TVO because of what happened in New Zealand. That has prompted this discussion. So, Stephanie, I wonder if, if part of the answer to what offends so many people is just simply ending the capability of live streaming on Facebook. What do you think of that idea? I think there's a lot to be said for that. Um, either there's nothing saying that we have to see everything in real time, whether that's a video or whether that's something that you know people are posted. Uh, you know, there is a, it's, it's a conscious choice that platforms have made to, to allow these capabilities. Um, there, you know, I've, I've seen mention that you know maybe they should look at, uh, at delaying or instituting you know, the kind of delay that you have on a lot of live TV programs. Um, so there are, I mean, there are other options there. Um, but again, I think you know, regardless of whether you delay it, you know, five minutes, half an hour, you still have uh, you know, 400 hours of uh, video are being uploaded to YouTube every minute. Uh, so mm. like, there, there's still, it's still a huge amount of scale. Um, so I mean, human moderators play a huge part of that. Uh, there's only so much they can do, um, and there's uh, there's always going to be when you have humans who are doing this. There's always going to be, uh, you know, some level of difference. You're not going to get uniform results. Sure. Uh, and at the same time, you know, AI they're making great strides, but I don't know if it's all the way there yet. And there's there's some things that either uh, they're not going to detect, or on the flip side of it, there could also be a lot of false positives. Well, Anatoly, I guess we should do the full disclosure thing right now. This program airs, of course, at eight o'clock on television, uh, but it also is live streamed on Facebook, and there will be people who are not near a television set, but who are watching us right now, live streamed at 8 p.m. Eastern Time on Facebook. If the answer is ban all live streaming, uh, I'm, I'm going to be presumptuous enough to say some good stuff is also going to get caught up with the bad stuff. What do we do about that? And that's the, uh, the problem at, at its core. So, and so far we've been talking about content moderation, so to decide whether to show something or to block it. 
But I think another important piece here is the filtering and recommendation systems that make the content to be visible to others uh, and to go uh, virally. And I think uh, not enough attention has been given to that aspect of social media platforms. And this is at the core of their business, of attention economy. So how do you compete for eyeballs and how do you decide among billions of pieces of information which content to, to show people. And unfortunately, the current recommender systems, uh, they optimize for engagement, uh, but not necessarily for you know, assessing whether this content will be harmful or not. So I think if we uh, look at these issues, uh, content moderation, yes, but also what actually is going to be pr promoted and by, by what platform, it's also an important aspect of it. Sarah, where do you weigh in on this issue of live streaming and whether we should or whether we should ban? Well, I agree with both of your guests who are in studio. Uh, I think, first of all, there's quite a gamut between turning a tool off and opening a tool to anyone at any time. And so there's quite a few things we could explore in between there. I find recommendation and, and vetting that there's quite a bit that could be done there too. So for example, we could take Steve Pike in the agenda and say, that's a known good actor. Uh, a known good quality program that's vetted. We allow live streaming. Um, an unknown person who jumps on uh, with unknown ends, maybe that needs some more vetting before it gets the live stream. Hmm. Okay, let me just switch gears a little bit on everybody here and to that end, read a piece that was in the New York Times uh, just earlier, uh, or I guess just uh, towards the end of last month. Uh, Sheldon, let's put this graphic up, shall we? Focusing only on moderation means that Facebook, YouTube, and other platforms such as Reddit don't have to answer for the ways in which their platforms are meticulously engineered to encourage the creation of incendiary content, rewarding it with eyeballs, likes, and in some cases, ad dollars. Let's follow up on this. Anatoly, what is, uh, this is Charlie Warzel in the New York Times writing, what does Charlie mean when he says, quote, engineered to encourage the creation of incendiary content? Mm -hmm. Well, the for platforms like Facebook, like Twitter to be in business, they need for people to engage with the content, mm -hmm. right? So all the systems that are de developed around social media platforms designed for you uh, to get your attention. And uh, each uh, piece of information competes uh, not just uh, for real estate on your small screens, but also uh, you want to make sure that the, show, the content you show people will actually engage with. And the problem is the system don't really differentiate the type of content they recommend, uh, which we found very problematic, uh, maybe fine for one area like entertainment, but we found it very problematic for areas like uh, misinformation and political discussions, mm -hmm. or the areas like misinformation and health discussions. Uh, here's an example, uh, one of the the studies we've done is related to YouTube and how YouTube recommend the system decides to show you which video to watch next. Uh, and this is a very powerful mechanism uh, because if a wrong video is shown to you, you may, and then another video in that space, uh, like anti-vaccination videos shown to you. Mm -hmm. And if you keep watching those videos, you may perceive that this is the, the, the reality, that's truthful information. Do your studies indicate that when, when YouTube automatically loads another video immediately after the one that you want to watch, most people will in fact watch the one that YouTube has popped up? So we don't know whether people actually watch it fully, but we do know that YouTube, YouTube's recommend algorithms more likely to recommend anti-vaccination videos than pro-vaccination videos. Huh. Uh, so that's a, that's a powerful influence then, potentially. Co correct, yes. Got it. Well, uh, okay, I'm not advocating this. I am merely asking the question. Uh, do we need re government regulation? Do we need any regulation here? Stephanie, weigh in on that. I think there has to be something better than what we have now, uh, where the, the companies have been trying to convince everyone for the last however many years that uh, self-regulation was just work, working just fine and they don't need to do anything else. Um, in Europe right now, the, the European Commission is looking at instituting a law that would uh, prohibit uh, or it would, it would force companies to take down any terrorist content within one hour of it being posted. Or else what? Uh, or else they could be fined for up to 4% of their global revenue. Oh, that, that'd get your attention. Yeah, it would, it would. And so this is, uh, a lot of uh, freedom of expression groups have uh, put forward huge concerns about this because they're saying, 
We don't know enough about how this is going to work. Uh, part of the law says that uh, they would have to take proactive measures, so which would mean some form of uh, upload filtering. Um, there's not enough transparency about whether they're doing this effectively. Uh, there's not a, a way to appeal this. Um, we don't know enough. We don't have enough visibility into how this whole system works. Uh, plus, with a fine like that, there's a, a danger that this will f they'll fall on the side of over censorship uh, because you don't want to you don't want to try and mess around with something that that's that huge. So they'd err on the side of taking things down that might be controversial or unpleasant, but not necessarily harmful. Inhibition as opposed to prohibition. Absolutely, yes. Gotcha. Yes, so there, there's, a, there's a, I mean, there's harms of overregulation, there's harms of underregulation. I think, uh, I don't know that anybody's got it right yet, but I think uh, the status quo is not necessarily effective. Hmm. Sarah, I'd like your view on that, whether or not there's a role for government and increased regulation here. Well, I concur with Stephanie's comments on the risks as well as the affordances of those moves. I think uh, whether or not we want the regulation to be coming, as she indicated, it's already here in some cases. And we can think of an example like Germany, which, which put forward its controversial Nets DG law uh, going towards enforcement of its own local anti-hate speech uh, legal implications and force the platforms to enforce those. So we're going to see more of that to be sure. I think it will be an ongoing problem for legislators to get it right when they can't see under the hood and they have very little understanding of how these systems work. That's not necessarily their fault. It doesn't mean that they're stupid or ignorant. It means that those systems have been closed and opaque for a decade and a half. So I think the first thing we have to do is demand the kind of transparency we all need to better understand what's going on. Sarah, have you been able to come to a conclusion yet about that German experience and whether it's had the, had the intended consequences that they wanted? I don't think I know enough about that case uh, from that perspective. What I can tell you is that certainly inspired a spate of hiring for content moderators who were familiar and local to the German context. So there, there have for sure been implications on that side. Hmm. Steffi, what about in Canada? Any attempts that you know of by Canadian authorities to increase regulations in this field? At this point, I don't think so. Um, Canada's in an interesting position because the American approach is much more informed by uh, their First Amendment. Their mm -hmm. idea of, of freedom of expression is a huge part of uh, American American law, American culture. They didn't call it the wild, wild west for nothing. They didn't. Yeah. And uh, these platforms uh, originated in the United States as well. So you've got mm -hmm. some you know, global governance and global jurisdiction issues to consider. Um, I think uh, you know Canada finds it in itself in an interesting position because it's sort of in between you know the, the European approach and the uh, the American approach uh, and we don't have a huge market so I don't know that we'd be able to to go our own way um, to try and find out a, our own solution so I know that uh, you know Canadian uh, uh, especially around Bill C-76 and some of the uh, the election and disinformation uh, um, legislation that's passed recently I know that they're they're taking a look and they're saying that they you know they want to work with the social media platforms more closely and they they want to do uh, introduce some more uh, um, you know, regulations around uh, advertising and around, uh, you know, keeping uh, keeping track of what uh, political advertising has been put on platforms. That's, so That's the gist of what C-76 is all about. For yes. those of us who don't know all those bills off the top yes, of our abso head. Yes, absolutely. Did you want to add to that, Anatoly? Yeah, I just uh, agree that let's start uh, with what actually quite obvious and quite dangerous, which is targeted ads. We've been mostly discussing organic content and user-generated content. And uh, as we can see, it's a very complex issue to, to regulate, uh, especially when companies uh, like Twitter, like Facebook, they say, we're utility, we're not the publisher. But the Bill C-76 is an, uh, an instrument to, to target directly um, ad advertisement that people pay money for. And so this is the space that is really um, open for regulation, especially in face of uh, false information that may be uh, used to propagate through those channels. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I would just like to put on the table in our remaining moments here the question, and Sarah, I'll start with you, the question of what our responsibility, as in members of the public, is in this circumstance. Um, I think it's been possible, I know it's been possible in the past, that if you wanted to, as a member of the public, you could dial up Facebook and watch somebody being beheaded in some Middle Eastern country for whatever reason. And, you know, there's lots of people, obviously, who will choose not to watch that for whatever reason, but there are still some who want to. What's our role in, what's our role and what's our responsibility in all of this, Sarah? 
Well, I think you're asking a very complex question that goes to uh, life offline as well as life online. Uh, the companies for a long time have been taking the position that they are in effect mirrors that are holding up an image back to society of what society already manifests. To a certain extent, I think that's true. So in that sense, um, you know, atrocities that are committed offline that are uploaded online have a problem in, in both worlds. That having been said, the platforms, uh, as we've gestured at in earlier comments, have an extreme profit motive that underlies their transmission of information. They're not, they're not a public utility and they don't do this for altruistic purposes. Um, that's, that's one point. I think the second point too is that uh, the mirror metaphor falls short when we think about the great uh, ability for amplification and circulation and dissemination that we've never before seen. So I think one of our roles and responsibilities here is to become informed users. And then once we do that, to push back on the platforms to demand the kind of space that we want to be in. Uh, that is not a space of beheadings and massacres and mosques, as far as I'm concerned. And I think that's the case for the majority of users. Hmm. Anatoly, where, what's our responsibility in this whole situation? Yeah. Well, platforms definitely have responsibilities because they amplify whatever bad and evil in our society exists and giving them platform. And their responsibility should be I take measures, either it's on content moderation, either that making more transparent how recommendation systems work, or maybe demonetize, make sure the spaces that they offer, the tools they offer for people to fundraise, uh, like charities, uh, they demonetize for those uh, hate speech type of content. Uh, as, as human beings, I think as social media users, there are responsibilities on us as well. Uh, and in that study where we look at hate speech on Facebook and how whether some of that you know, slipped through community moderation, we also found that a lot of, and that was Canadian context, a lot of Canadians, which I'm very proud of that uh, result, actually would step up and speak against sp hate speech. So I think it's important for us as social media users make sure that those spaces, uh, the you know, haters feel in minority. Mm -hmm. And if they feel in minority and holding minority point of view, it's, uh, le it's less likely they will speak up, in, at least in this public online environments. Stephanie, your view on that. Yeah, I mean, I agree with both of those points. Uh, and I think uh, another issue, and this is happening a lot in the field of, uh, of disinformation, is uh, looking at public education and public literacy. Um, because there are, you know, we do have uh, the platforms, even if they're allowing people to, to speak and to say, you know, abhorrent things, um, you know, people can, you know, it's, the platforms can still choose whether to elevate it or not. But I think there's also, um, it, it, there's something to be said for, um, you know, educating people about whether some of these things are, are true. Um, you know, there's going to be hateful people out there no matter what, but, um, you know, you can, you can try and, uh, you know, as Anatoly mentioned, if you can do, I think, more research is needed to see if, uh, you know, what kind of uh, interventions would work. Uh, well, I am, I am curious, Anatoly. I know mm -hmm. this is your business. This is your field. This is your passion, your interest of research. Are you ever overwhelmed by all of the toxicity and mm -hmm. filth that you would happen upon in the course of doing your job? Well, it comes with the territory, and uh, certainly as somebody who's been looking at a lot of content, including hateful content, you got unfortunately accustomed to it. Uh, but when you engaged other researchers, especially junior researchers, you really had to make sure that they are ready uh, and have some support and training offered to them if they also encounter this content. Mm. But look, this is a research environment, so there are lots of uh, measures we can put in place to prepare people to see this content. The challenge is how unprepared people, average social media users, how they react, how they feel, and how that hateful and negative content can impact their lives. So that's, I think, it, it's a dangerous part of it. Sarah, let me give you an opportunity to weigh in. You'll get the last word on this. Ever overwhelmed by all of this? Yes. Yes, I am. I've been looking at this topic since 2010, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty close to it and pretty familiar with what goes on online. Every now and then, I, I have a chance to reflect uh, on on that environment and its impacts on me and as Anatoly said, on uh, others in our community. 
And as a seasoned researcher, I know it has impacts on me. So that that bears the question, what about everyone else? And I think that we really don't have a longitudinal sense of what these impacts will be for years to come. That's a worrisome thing, not just for me personally, but I think for all of us in 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 the social fabric. And I I think we're going to have to attend to that. There there may well be a bill due down the road. Hmm. That's Sarah T. Roberts, uh, assistant professor of information studies at UCLA. We thank you for joining us, Sarah, on the line uh, via Skype from Los Angeles, California, and to our friends here in the studio as well. Stephanie McClellan from CG, the Center for International Governance Innovation, Anatoly Grujda from Ryerson University's Social Media Lab. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.